Kit Carson, Part 20. After the organization of the volunteers, the governor appointed Captain Saran St. Brain of Taos as their commander. He was a gentleman in every manner qualified for this office, having passed the greater part of his life in the mountains and in this territory. When the people learned of the appointment, there was great rejoicing for all knew that the captain was a gentleman and the bravest of soldiers, and they were confident that under his leadership, the Indians would be punished so thoroughly that it would be long before they would again commit hostilities. In fact, this was the only appointment of the governor that met the approbation of the people, and many were surprised at his sound judgment in making such a noble choice. In February 1855, Colonel T.T. T. Fauntleroy of the 1st Dragoons arrived in Taos and began preparing to take the field. He had under his command four companies of volunteers commanded by Colonel St. Brain, two companies of dragoons, one of artillery, and one of spies. The latter was commanded by Lucian Stewart of this place, a gentleman who has passed a great deal of his life in the mountains and, having had a great deal of experience in Indian warfare, he was well qualified to perform the duties for which he was employed. The command left Taos early in March and traveled north to Fort Massachusetts. From here, it marched to the Rio del Norte, up this river to the place it leaves the mountain, and thence north to the Saquachi Pass, where the Indians were found in force. They were attacked and defeated, losing a number of warriors killed and wounded. After the fight, the artillery company was left at the Sequatchie Pass in charge of the train of provisions. It was a very important position requiring an officer who was judicious and fearless of danger. Lieutenant Lloyd Beale of the 2nd Artillery was chosen for this duty, which he discharged to the satisfaction of the colonel. The main command continued in pursuit of the Indians and after a few days discovered a large party on the headwaters of the Arkansas. The soldiers charged upon them immediately and defeated them. Some of the warriors were killed and many horses were taken. We then began the return march, traversing the Moscow Pass and reaching Fort Massachusetts at the end of March. The country we passed through while en route to Sequatchie Pass was level and covered with snow, and during this time the weather was as cold as I have ever experienced. The remainder of the march was over high mountains covered with snow. I returned to Taos while the command was distributed among the several settlements so that forage could be procured for the animals, which were in a very reduced condition. The soldiers remained at the settlement until the middle of April and then started on another campaign. I did not accompany this expedition. Colonel T.T. T. Fauntleroy took the same direction as the one followed in the previous campaign and traveled to the Punchy Pass, where the Indians were found and entirely routed. Many of them were killed, and a number of animals and much camp equipage was captured. Colonel St. Vrain now marched through the Sangre de Cristo Pass and on to the Purgatory River where the Indians were discovered. They were completely routed and their animals and baggage captured. He then followed their trail, sending out men in pursuit of them in every direction. Warriors were killed daily and their women taken prisoners. In this campaign, the Apaches received a chastisement for their many depredations, such as they had thought could never be given them. The command now returned to Taos, and Colonel Fauntleroy did not again take the field. The volunteers had but a short period to serve, but St. Vrain did not allow them to be idle. He immediately took the field again and kept them in pursuit of the Indians until a few days before the expiration of their time of service. If they had continued in the service three months longer and had been under the command and sole direction of Colonel St. Vrain, there would never again have been any need of troops in this part of the country. The Indians would have been entirely subjugated, and in all probability but a few of them would have remained to cause trouble in the future. But this was not to be. The authorities in control considered the Indians had been sufficiently punished, and when they asked for peace, it was granted them. 
In August, the superintendent made treaties with the Indians that had not been at war. In September, the hostile Indians came in and received presents and promised friendship for the future. Not all the Apaches came in at the time of the treaty, however. Some of them remained out committing depredations, and this fact was reported to the superintendent, but he would not believe it. No treaty should have been made with the Apaches, for no faith can be placed in their promises. By the treaties that were made, the Indians were promised certain sums yearly in case they wished to settle on some stream and commence farming, and they were given their choice of country to settle. The superintendent went on to Washington with his treaties, which were laid before the Senate. They have not been confirmed as yet, nor should they be, as they are not of a character to suit the people. The Apaches are now committing depredations daily, which go unpunished. And in my opinion, they may again commence hostilities ere long. The other tribes with whom treaties were made will comply with their provisions, I think, and will not be hostile again if the government does not stop their supplies. I frequently visit the Indians, speak to them of the advantages of peace, and exert my influence to them satisfied to keep them satisfied with the proceedings of those placed in power over them. On September 4, 1856, I attended the Assembly of Indians held by the superintendent at Abiqui for the purpose of giving them presents. They appeared to be contented, but there was a disturbance the next day. A Tabakwachi, Utah, had been given a blanket which was old and worn. He, he was dissatisfied and tore it up and endeavored to kill the superintendent, but was prevented by the other Indians. I cannot see how the superintendent can expect any of the Indians to depart satisfied after he has called them to see him from a distance of two or three hundred miles and compelled them to go several days without anything to eat except what they have brought with them. They are given a meal by the superintendent after which the presents are distributed. Some receive a blanket. Those that get none are given a knife or a hatchet or some vermilion or a piece of red or blue cloth or some sugar and perhaps a few more trinkets. If they were left in their own country, they could be more. They could more than earn the quantity of gifts they received in one day's hunt. They could hunt for skins and furs, and the traders could furnish them with the same articles which the government gives them, and they'd be saved the necessity of coming such a distance, with the consequent fatigue to their animals and the necessity of having to travel without food themselves. If presents are given, it should be done in their own country. They should not be allowed to come into the settlements, for every visit an Indian makes to a town causes him more or less injury. End of part 20.